Good morning, everyone. Today is May 26, 2020. My name is Dawn Dole, and I'm the Executive Director for the Taos Institute. I would like to welcome everyone to this call, uh, we, which we call the Dialogue with the Author. And today, our author guest is Wynn Schwartz, and I will be talking about him in a minute. Um, the Taos Institute is a nonprofit educational organization, and we've been around for 26 years now. We're really excited about that. Uh, we started in Taos, New Mexico, thus the name Taos Institute. It was a very um, meaningful location where we held our first two conferences, and the mission of the organization is to bring together practitioners and scholars and academics and students from around the world to come together in dialogue around social construction and constructionist practices. How do we bring theory and practice together? How do we create the world we most want to live in through our relational and social practices? So that's what we study, that's what we look for um, and do research around, and we welcome all of you to this call today. Uh, the book that we're going to be discussing is Descriptive Psychology and the Person Concept, a new book. And Wynn Schwartz is the clinical psychologist and psychoanalyst offering psychotherapy, consultation, and supervision in Boston for more than 30 years. He's professor on the core faculty of William James College and a lecturer at Harvard Medical School. He's taught at Wesley College, the Boston Psychoanalytic Society and Institute, and the Massachusetts Institute of Psychoanalysis. Wynn supervises trainee psycho psychotherapists at the Cambridge Hospital, and he's on the editorial board for the American Journal of Psychotherapy. So we want to welcome all of you and welcome Wynn. I'm going to turn it over to you. Uh, one more thing about the chat feature. Please feel free to use the chat throughout the call for questions, comments, resources, anything you'd like to contribute to the conversation, please feel free to use the chat feature. And when I turn it over to you. Good morning. Uh, it's nice to see you all uh, in these um, strange and uh, unexpected time, although I've sort of lost my sense of where I am in time and sometimes time and space these days, which seems to be a kind of common feature. Um, exactly. I've got some slides. I know I had have a format that I was uh, expecting to follow, uh, which I'll probably follow, but what I did, I'm going to back up just a step or two, or two which is um, I'm going to talk about the book. I'm going to talk about the uh, the, the orienting concepts that um, that I worked with, uh, and it was a and I it was a text that I actually used for the first time um, in a class I teach at Harvard Extension on case studies and lives of persons, where we spent um, a good deal of uh, the orientation looking at the different perspectives and looking at persons. Um, the different kinds of, uh, of stances and things that would get in the way of, of interviewing and, and learning about, uh, about character um, with the idea that we would end up with a kind of methodology for uh, performing empathic, empathetic interviews, and then a methodology for checking with the interviewee the, uh, the usefulness of the formulations that we, we developed. And this was going to be done, you know, out in the world. Uh, so the first part of the semester, um, you know, was taught at, partly online. It was an international group of students, uh, mostly graduate students, some undergraduates from all around the planet. Um, so we started that way. And then there was a classroom in, in front of me that I, I had uh, students in. Uh, after I'd gotten through the basic concepts that I wanted people to, to, to work with, um, things got weird, got weird for all of us. Uh, uh, Harvard closed down. Um, we went fully online, and the shift of the course rapidly moved pretty much on the uh, motivation of the students to can we actually use these concepts, or any, which which of these concepts in particular um, might be serviceable for us to um, make some sense as a community, the community that was sort of developing online with this group, a community that. Uh, is existing in various places, people with different resources, different positions of privilege, some people quite quite secure and comfortable, some people nearly desperate, some frontline responders, some people in areas that had been untouched, uh, people who uh, couldn't attend uh, 
funerals, uh, wakes, memorials for their uh, deceased um, family members, uh, people locked in houses uh, by themselves or locked in circumstances with welcome or unwelcome roommates, uh, people who uh, enjoy uh, isolation and um, solitude, people who are fond of immersing themselves in their uh, introspections, these were largely the academics, and then others who need a lot of feedback, a lot of social engagement, just to correct their own ways of thinking. To uh, they, need, they, need, they need immediate contact with community. And a number of these people were finding themselves um, coming apart. And so part of what our concerns were was, you know, how can we make sense of this in, as best we could and what kind of community we could form in chats and online discussion that we would, would monitor. Uh, so I had initially planned on, um, you know, basically taking us through, through my book, uh, which I'll, I'll start with. But then I want to use some of the tools that the class found of value to see if they're of any utility for us. Um, so let me backtrack again. Uh, back in 1985, um, Kenneth Gergen and Keith Davis's uh, seminal volume, The Social Construction of, uh, of the Person, one of the first volumes that introduced many of us to social constructionism, had as one of its orienting chapters, Peter Osorio's, an overview of, of descriptive psychology. Uh, that, and this chapter identified a budget of problems with um, existing social science, with existing behavioral sciences, with, um, with psychology. Uh, and one of the fu fundamental dilemmas was that it was very difficult to find anywhere in general psychology or in the social sciences for that matter, an explicit systematic identification of what the subject matter itself was, of what, uh, what we mean by persons, persons in their ways, and what the logic of interconnection is that would allow us to get from any particular group of facts about persons to other, other facts. Um, and that was what Osorio's enterprise was partly about, which was to create a kind of pre-empirical foundation for systematically uh, engaging in the study of, of persons um, without violating certain sort of basic foundational um, competencies that are required to act as one of us. And some of these have to do with um, what it means to actually make choices, to uh, engage in social practices, uh, themes of accountability and agency, um, deliberate action, cognizant action, themes that, and how to interconnect these with uh, the rest of the behavioral science as a top-down beginning point. So he built a map, a very complicated map, which I'll describe some, some small pieces of. Uh, and then what the book does is it more or less takes us up to date with how the community of, of practitioners and scholars uh, of various sorts um, have continued in this, this line of work. Um, and uh, what I'll actually be making use of uh, a little later is uh, some of the work of Anthony Putman, the late Anthony Putman's work on community and culture. So that's... Uh, that's what I want to talk about. So let me, let me get my slide up to see if I can get it properly done now. Uh, screen share. Let me know if I've done this. Is it up there yet? Dawn, is it up? No, it's not up yet. Okay. Oh, let's see what I'm doing wrong here. Okay. It's good. Is it there now? Yes. Okay, that's my book. That's the copy of the book. That's, uh, you know. Um, so what I want to talk about is, is the person concept. Um, I'll take us through, a you know, a kind of uh, the, the basic components just by pointing what, what, out what they are. And... Um, 
And then later, I'm hoping that, that we can discuss uh, certain the, the methodologies that people found of particular use um, in navigating what their current circumstances. And those, those methodologies we'll look at at the very end of my presentation, which involve the relationship formulas, um, uh, in particular the unless clauses, why people do things unless they have reason to do something else. Um, and, uh, and then we're going to look at the judgment diagram, how people judge uh, what goes on in a set of circumstances, how they weigh their options, and um, some, uh, some other features of that. And but let me begin with this uh, orienting slogans. These um, guide, in many ways, the, uh, our practice. So they certainly serve as a kind of set of reminders for the community of people that identify as descriptive psychologists. The first is that the world makes sense, and so do people. They make sense now. They already make sense to begin with. Osorio started with this point as a kind of reminder that sensibility has to be a given. We have to understand how things ordinarily are, how they make sense before we're in any position to point out that something doesn't make sense. For us to identify things, incompetencies or um, uh, inaccuracies or um, unrealistic expectations or things that um, seem out of the ordinary, in order to identify an anomaly, um, in order to identify a mystery, First, there has to be some basic understanding, appreciation of how things ordinarily are, how things ordinarily seem. So we begin with the idea that sensibility, the reasonable sensibility that we have, that we rely on in our ordinary social practices um, are a given. Um, that misunderstanding is the exception rather than the rule. That confusion is the uh, exception rather than the rule. But given many of us are clinicians and many of us have to navigate uncertainties and uh, confusions and at times mysteries, it's good to have some methodologies for uh, making sense of them. So that's one slogan. Another is it's one world, everything fits together, everything is related to everything else. That in, in any coherent science of persons, um, given that every idea, every observation, Every set of facts, uh, every theory um, is someone's. Um, they have to in some fashion fit together as something that a particular individual or community can make sense of, given that person's, that community's competencies. Everything fits together. And the person concept is going to be an attempt to show a, a kind of map, a top-down map of what you have to start with to, to mm -hmm. integrate things together. A third... Things are what they are and not something else instead. Um, and this has been a, you know, a, a minefield in behavioral science in which at times rather than talking about persons, we talk about physiologies or organisms or uh, stimulus response uh, uh, mechanisms. Um, uh, we, time, we, we develop um, theories that um, don't allow for the possibility of deliberation or choice or deliberate action. Um, that what our goal is and what the goal of this community has been is to be able to, to, to provide a kind of a, an empirically sound, conceptually sound basis for talking about persons as persons and not as something else. Um, and the fourth is, uh, you know, don't count on the world uh, being simpler than it has to be. Um, Many of us uh, certainly are fond of reductionisms and fond of Occam's razor and want to make our understandings as precise, as elegant, as simple as we can. But we also, uh, it's important to remember, I think Whitehead's rejoinder that, um, that we should seek simplicity but distrust it. Um, the world's a complicated place. And one of the places where we'll see these complications writ large is in the concept of motivation, where often our behavioral sciences, our economics, our um, all different manners of trying to construct what we take to be human motivation or non-human motivation 
has started with too uh, small a set of principles. Historically, it's focused on hedonics um, and to some extent prudence on pain and pleasure as motivations, for example, uh, reward punishment um, or self-interest. And um, uh, I think this, what we find in terms of actual human behavior is that it, it's more complicated than that. So that's, those are kind of, you know, if you will, slogans that are kind of positions to, uh, that in doing this work I live by. So let me take you to the concept. What are the kinds of moving parts? And you know what the book is primarily about, what the, the text is about, um, is you know an attempt to unfold these with methodologies to uh, allow us to connect them all together. We'll start with the individual person. But individual persons engage in behavior. And the behavior that individuals engage in, uh, the kind of behavior that's of most interest to us, is a goal-directed, intentional, purposeful behavior, behavior that has significance. Behavior that um, we can speak about behavior that involves distinctions that in our verbal life, in our um, communicative life, um, we can, um, we have something to say about. To the effect that in one of the, the points that we won't really get to today, but I think is central to the, the linguistic notions of competencies, is that there's nothing that we know that we can't say something about that we can use language to identify, to describe, to evoke, to uh, enjoin, to remind, but that using our natural languages, including our technical languages and our mathematics, we can in some fashion get at all the distinctions that, um, that we actually have a awareness of. Uh, that doesn't mean they're all equally competent at doing it. It's just that it's a natural feature of, of language um, to have that potential. So we are individuals uh, who behave and can uh, distinguish linguistically what these behaviors are, and we do so in a world. We do so in a, you know, on the stage of, of the different elements of the world, of objects, processes, events, uh, the state of affairs. And the system itself is, has a set of transition rules, uh, composition and decomposition rules to allow us to look at at these, um, these elements. But all of this occurs um, within a culture and within the various communities of a culture. That in order to have the point language, you've got to have social practices. In order to have social practices, you've got to have the done thing that allows people to do certain things together. Um, so that's, those would be the fundamental interconnected concepts. A person who behaves uh, in a world um, in which the behavior is uh, in, in involves um, the various social practices, uh, idiosyncratic in general, that are part of being a, a member in good standing or not so good standing in the different communities and roles, um, and that we have something to say about all these. So. So let me start there. The person concept has as its five interdependent component concepts these, these, uh, these distinctions. Each of these distinctions has a set of sub-distinctions, all of which interconnect to all of the others. Let me begin by, uh, let me continue if I may. If I can get over my initial awkwardness here, which may or may not happen. Um, with what we mean, what I mean by an individual person, uh, a little bit of a backstory. Um, it may be apocryphal, but uh, one of the introductions some of us had to this subject matter was um, learning about um, a NASA uh, contract question 
that basically when if green gas in the moon speaks to an astronaut, how do we know whether or not it's a person? Um, what do we mean by a person in the first place? What, did, what, what What's involved in that identification? We had various answers in philosophy and theology and uh, uh, journalists certainly had a sense of it. Um, but what we didn't have is any clear systematic answer within the behavioral sciences. Um, and the point of raising the question initially was, well, could we talk about uh, non-human persons? Could we talk about robotic persons? Um, uh, could we, and what, what are the, what are the near misses? What constitutes a person? And it went through a series of iterations, but, um, the point that many of us finally arrived at, and I, and this, this is a paradigm case formulation. Uh, it's a formulation that I developed to uh, at uh, in about seven or eight years ago. There was a conference on, at Yale on uh, possible persons, and there one of the fundamental issues was um, the question of the person of personhood of uh, of non-human primates, uh, uh, the rights, the obligations, the um, the legal issues. The questions are about robotics, uh, questions about artificial intelligence. Um, but what we needed was a kind of uh, paradigm case formulation of what, what's involved in talking about a person. I talk a good deal about paradigm case formulations in the, um, in, in the book. Uh, the place where some of you may be familiar with them is um, in, in legal practice where we have um, a paradigm cases, we have typical cases, cases that illustrate in the most complex ways all of the important nuances. A paradigm case is a methodology that is quite useful when definitions are um, hard to come by. Um, and a paradigm case is a kind of top down where you start with, um, well, you start with an example or some set of characteristics that every competent observer uh, should be able to recognize that if all of these things are present, well, if all these things are present, we have no good reason to doubt that we're talking about whatever the case is. Um, so generally, we look for a, um, a, the most complex case, an archetypal case, um, a, a good exemplar. So with that in mind, in my own idiosyncratic way, this is what I, I put together, uh, uh, which largely, which the beginning of which ends with uh, Osorio's notion that a person is an individual who paradigmatically engages in deliberate action. And let me break down the components just a bit. So the person, we're talking about an individual, we're not talking about um, Star Trek's Borg, we're not talking about hives. Um, those may have person characteristics, but they're something else. We're talking about the person in the sense of you, me, all of you guys here, um, um, maybe Coco the gorilla, maybe my dog with some things left out. Um, but you'll see the point of my putting that together that way in a few moments, perhaps. So a person is an individual who paradigmatically, and by paradigmatically, what I mean is that they're not, people aren't always doing these things. They aren't even always capable of these things. But the paradigm of what we mean by a person means the possibility to find these characteristics. That when all of these characteristics are present, um, then we have a paradigm, we have an example that most of us should be able to agree um, constitutes at least an example of a person. Uh, uh, a human person, for example, is a, a, a member of our species, a homo sapien, who paradigmatically engages in deliberate action. And by deliberate action, what I'm described, what I'm talking about is an intentional or goal-directed behavior, um, but a specific sort. Uh, it's a behavior in which I both am cognizant of what I'm doing and I choose to do it. So it starts with the, as a given, as a given, a given that is, you know, central to concepts of criminality and tort, to contracts, to um, uh, 
the accountable notion that I can make choices. I'm aware of the choices that I, I make and I am the actor who's making those choices. There may be all sorts of constraints. Uh, my freedom to make these choices are going to be constrained by my other personal characteristics and my opportunities. Um, but that we take it as a given insofar as we treat each other as accountable or as responsible that in some fashion, the buck stops with you. In some fashion, um, you are the author, the creator, uh, the instigator. And um, you're not always doing that. Often you're not. Uh, often you're acting impulsively, non-deliberately, um, uh, not thinking things through. But that um, the paradigmatic person is eligible to do so and is able to do so. People also um, engage in uh, language, verbal behavior, uh, deliberate symbolic verbal behavior, which I'm not going to say very much about because that takes us into a whole other, other direction. Uh, we don't always speak, we're not always able to speak, but it, um, well, for one thing, one of the values of, of putting language in as uh, one of the paradigmatic, one of the foundational concepts of what we mean by persons is that it's extraordinarily useful in detecting persons. It's especially useful in recognizing concepts of choice. Um, uh, Peter Clawford and others raised some questions some years ago about, well, what's the value, what's the main value of cognizance or consciousness? And uh, Clawford pointed out, well, one of the things that you can do is you can recognize, you can think through what you do, what you're doing and what you've decided not to do. You're able to represent to yourself in consciousness and for us, linguistically, um, the high road or the low road? Which road do I want to take? What am I going to do? You only see me go on the high road. Did I choose to do so? Well, a good piece of evidence may be if I said, well, you know, there was that fork in the road. And, uh, you know, I decided to, well, actually, I took the low road last time, and I'd see where that got me. So this time I'm going to take the high road. Doesn't look like it might be as much fun, but I think I'm going to get in less trouble at the end. I can represent verbally what I didn't do, which is one of your, one pretty decent way. Not approving a choice has been made, but providing evidence that a choice might be made. Another sort of side note. In our behavioral sciences, um, we don't prove anything. We're not proving things the way we would prove in a mathematic, uh, mathematical or logical formulation. What we're doing is we're assembling evidence that for a particular so we're assembling evidence that shows that it makes sense to continue to talk or think about things one way rather than another way or that it doesn't make as much sense to talk one way or, or, or another way um, the fact that i can say well i went right rather than left um, doesn't prove that in fact i had that choice but it should provide a pretty sound evidence that um, that might be what had occurred so I engage, I can engage deliberately. Um, I can make choices. I can potentially speak about them. And the choices that I make, what I choose to do, um, and what will in time um, be a way to identify how I behave in character or out of character, um, will have something to do with the, my individual perspectives and concerns. The ones that I developed uh, in individually, invented myself, came from my family, came from my community, came from my culture, came from God knows where, but that I have my own perspectives and concerns. And amongst these perspectives and concerns, we can identify at least these four intrinsic categories. These are family resemblance groups. Um, I'm not going to argue about how they can be reduced one to the other because historically we've attempted to do that in different ways. So let me just indicate that these will be collections of things that people will use to justify um, uh, the reasons they went about one one did one act rather than another. Um, 
they these are the these are perspectives that a person has, um, and these are part of the multiple pers perspectives that all of us all of us have um, that uh, some wave more than others, and we'll look at that in a little more detail when we look at the the methodology of the, the judgment diagrams. But then, why do I do what I do? Well, I'm concerned with uh, hedonics, um, pleasure, pain, disgust, noxiousness. Um, you know, some things, if it feels good, I continue to do it because it feels good. And, um, and there are things that I, you know, that I, that I would like that are pleasurable or they're painful that I avoid. Uh, although at times I may actually approach the pain for some, some other set of reasons. But I do think for reasons of pleasure. And, and you know, we've got a long history of uh, psychology is based on hedonics um, from our uh, early behaviorisms, uh, the the whole beginnings of psychodynamic theory. Um, and with that prudence, um, I don't always seek uh, initially pleasure, although I may recognize a pleasurable opportunity, but it might not be in my self-interest to do so. It might not be my, to my advantage or disadvantage. Uh, so I do things because they feel good in the, uh, in the visceral sense or in other senses of talking about something that, that has that, that sense of pleasure or pain. I also make choices based on what I think is in my self-interest. Um, and I may weigh these things. Now, I also suspect that my dog, my cat, um, uh, my box turtle, uh, more or less does so too. Although in the absence of language, um, it's a little harder for me, me to tell. But in observing animal behavior, non-human animal behavior, uh, I have little or no doubt that they're, you know, selecting a course of action. Worms I'm not so clear about, but selecting a course of action based on, uh, on the affective response, the visceral response of pain, pleasure, noxiousness, and have different versions of what, what is in their self-interest. There are two other categories that may be quintessentially categories of motivation that um, typifies the behavior of persons that we have less evidence of in, in non-persons. Um, one is aesthetics, although I think cases are being made now that um, it certainly looks like certain groups of animals uh, in some ways following the evolutionary concepts of spandrels, um, Gould's notion, that, that there's lots of things that, that, that are done merely because of how well they fit together. Um, and that we can talk about, um, I mean, why did I put on this outfit and even these, I'm not wearing sweatpants for the first time this week. I mean, even though you're not going to swell. Oh, yeah, I'm wearing, I can't get my idea that high. Um, because it fits together. It fit, you know, I, this is the first time I've been in my my actually office on the in the Prudential Center for about a month and a half because I've been working out of a room in my house, but I wanted this background rather than the, the cluttered room that I ordinarily sit in. I made a set of aesthetic choices, what I thought was more fitting in an uh, artistic, intellectual, or social domain. Um, the well-formed formula, um, the uh, the elegant drawing, the selection of this word rather than that word. Um, Issues of, of, of truth, rigor, objectivity, closure, fit. These kinds of aesthetic qualities are qualities that um, I need no other reason to do certain kinds of acts than just those. Um, why is it that I wanted to solve that formula? Because the result is beautiful. It's elegant to do it this way. Yeah, but don't you make your, earning, your living that way? Actually, no. Although if you can figure out a way for me to uh, make a buck on that, I'll do that too, because I don't have two reasons to do it. Um, so we do things for reasons of aesthetics. And aesthetics often um, involve notions of choice or selectivity. I've chosen uh, this word rather than that word. I've chosen to put on these slacks rather than the others. I've chosen this background. Um, I've chosen to solve the problem this way rather than some other way. Um, I find this fit um, to provide me with closure, with satisfaction um, in ways that have nothing to do with, with pain or pleasure and very little to do with self-interest, except that it, um, it provides me with a, 
a, found, a fundamental satisfaction to fit these things together. And then there's a fourth category. There may be fifth, sixth, seventh, eighth category. There may be many, many more categories. It's just that these are the, the, the list that, uh, uh, that I have, to have, that I've derived from Osorio's work. Um, and it's, um, you know, if, if you have all, uh, additional intrinsic motivations, uh, motivational categories, um, you know, that would be great. I mean, there's no reason that this list is not an, an exclusive list. Uh, it's, uh, and part of what goes on classically in descriptive psychology is the goal is to create a map that allows for inclusion of other logical uh, possibilities and that allows for the um, connection of other observations that might not have easily, that might not have well fit with the existing set of concepts. So it's an open network of ideas. Um, it's an open network in which what matters in some ways are the, the logical soundness of the connections and the uh, pragmatic utility of the elements. Okay, so people act deliberately sometimes with awareness that they're doing things sometimes. I can, I'm talking about it right now as I choose what to say and as I, I deal with my um, anxiety about presenting this way uh, and speak about that in part because it, it may be in my best interest to, to get some sympathy from you guys about um, my anxiousness about presenting this way. I mean, we play a lot of games at the same time. A lot of different motivations may be going on. But out of that, over time, insofar as my behavior makes sense, that my behavior isn't, you know, just a random or an arbitrary uh, weighing or selection of, of, uh, of behaviors, integral to my character, what makes me a character of a particular sort, is that um, some things are more significant to me than others. Uh, some things matter more to others. Um, and over time, observing um, how my behavior makes sense as a character on the stage of my particular world in my particular communities, uh, what results is a dramaturgical pattern, which is a life tells a story. Um, uh, a life leaves a world in its wake. Um, actually, the derivative of, of uh, the word world is a, an Anglo-Saxon um, term which described the course of a person's life. That my life makes sense uh, because at different times, there's a variety of things that I find personally significant that matter to me. There and of, um, amongst these, there will be certain core principles, core values that will guide many of my choices when I have the opportunity to make them. That, um, that my behavior will show the patterns of what I find significant. And this is what I'm going to describe as through lines, um, a concept that came out of Janoskowski's uh, method acting, uh, that a member of my community, Brian Harnsberger, uh, developed when he was looking at uh, what holds together the choices that an alcoholic makes as he moves or she moves from um, being a drunk through being a drunk in AA, um, how one can continue to live certain values, um, but to participate in different ways. Uh, uh, a set of concepts that we see in, in uh, 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 Mary Roberts' works, as she talks about, as she talked about how um, significance is implemented through different performances, but that what a person, the hierarchy of significance, the greater, the greater the significance of some meaning is to a person, the higher that the set of values are, the more foundational or um, uh, the more, put, let me better state it, I hope, the more the value is central to my sense of integrity, to who I am, to who I must be, the more you're likely to see me not just play lip service, not just talk the talk, but to um, actually engage in behaviors and actions that are understandable given what I individually um, find as my hedonic, prudent, aesthetic, and ethical or moral set of um, perspectives. So these will be my North Stars, and they'll, they'll vary under circumstances. To, to jump ahead, um, part of what uh, I, um, this, my class began to wonder about 
is how did their choice principles, how did the through lines of their lives shift under the conditions of the pandemic? So that's the paradigm case formulation. Um, and just to give a very brief description of, of what we mean by agency, of what the actor does, um, because that's what I'm going to use this, uh, I don't know if, you, if you're seeing my arrow here, but this diamond is, is, is the conventional image that we use in descriptive psychology to represent an intentional action. Uh, and an action that involves something that a person wants, and they want from their perspective of hedonics, prudence, aesthetics, and uh, ethical and moral perspectives. To want something, but to, do, to get it now means you recognize, you distinguish something in your circumstances that gives you a chance to get what you want. And for the behavior to occur non accidentally, you have to have some competence. You have to know how to do something about it. Um, we don't observe what people want, what people want, know, or recognize. Uh, what we observe are their performances and achievements. And we can actually use this as a way of mapping out all different kinds of interventions, um, different focuses of theory, and so on. And what a person, the other parameter that's that's going to be of relevance to what you know, I was talking about a bit before and where I will turn to in a bit is the notion of significance, which is what I'm doing by doing the act in question, what, in which the action may implement something of greater importance to me. Um, so that, I want us to hold that in, in, in mind for a moment, which is that intentional actions involve um, uh, motivation, uh, Rec uh, you, one, has, one recognizes an opportunity in the current circumstances to get something that one wants, to accomplish something that one wants to do. Um, uh, based on the complexity of one's motivations, what under these circumstances look like the opportunity to do something that allows one to engage in what one finds personally significant. Um, and there can, And that that's going to occur in a particular performance that's going to achieve something that's going to make some difference in the world from it being as trivial as I simply, you know, take the glass and, you know, wet my lips to the possibility that um, I've actually clarified some of these ideas, uh, which we'll see. Um, so when we've got a lot of uh, conversation going on in the chat, I don't know if yeah. you want to take a look at that. Um, respond to some of the thoughts or if you'd like to put them into breakout groups so that the chat conversation can be live for a few minutes. I don't know where you are in your slide. Uh, let me go, let me, let me jump ahead and just provide okay. one other methodology and then we can, then, then let's, let's go there. Okay. Um, so I'm going to skip ahead. What I would just wanted to point out is that we can use these parameters to talk about how a behavior makes sense or how it doesn't make sense ordinarily, which is, uh, um, we expect behaviors to follow one's motivation. What looks like is obvious that what, you know, if, if I have, uh, if Jack has relation R to Jill, then we expect Jack and respected Jill to act on that relationship. If, if, you know, if, if Jill is, 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 you know, Jack's best friend, we expect Jack to, uh, to act uh, in a friendly, you know, kind fashion to, towards Jill, unless there's other relationships that are more important, doesn't recognize what the relationship is and so on. Um, well, maybe we can jump ahead a bit. Uh, so let me just, I'm just going to add one, one feature and then, then let's see where the, where the questions take us, which is that, well, I'm a psychoanalyst as it turns out. And as a result, I do spend some time wondering about the things that people actually do that may involve, uh, motivations that they may not be so comfortable recognizing, that they may de be defensive about it, they may not be able to recognize at all. And some of what we focused on in the study group and in the, uh, the seminar was how under the circumstances of the pandemic, um, where a person couldn't titrate their movement from one location to another, where they were stuck with the cast of characters they were stuck with most likely, um, uh, and where they had to deal with these sort of restrictions in life, um, what aspects of their lives became more front and center? And the other question we began to wonder about is, uh, and here we added um, some empirical stuff, uh, the Levinson's notion that um, at least an adult character, 
it may take three to five years to develop a new set of characteristics um, that may or may or may not remain stable for about seven, seven years plus or minus two. But the point of that was to wonder if we are behaving differently um, for a long enough period of time, does the choices that we begin to make, given our motivations, that are that given things that are available during that period of time, if they're long enough and stable enough, do things that before were out of character become in character? Do we find ourselves um, looking at the world differently than we would ordinarily look at, at the world? And in so doing, given the fact that all of us are more or less in a common set of circumstances, um, we make, our, we make our choices by being in some recognized overall circumstance. And in a recognized circumstance, we have different reasons to do different kinds of things. The circumstance of the pandemic, of the enclosure, of the restriction in behavior, of the disease, the unclean, the fear of contamination, the being in a position of scarcity, of opportunity, of having different resources and having to make choices under a very common set of adverse circumstances, opportunities for some, uh, major hazards for others. How might that change overall patterns of choice principles? And what we began to wonder about were sort of two things. One was what kinds of populisms, what kinds of mass movements can, can emerge out of, out of this the idea being that adversity rarely brings out the best in us. It tends to make people mean, selfish, uh, self-protective. Occasionally, people rise to the occasion. The fear of contamination um, makes the other, the stranger, and even members of one's own kin, potential dangers, leads to wanting to build walls. Or does it throw us into a kind of understanding of common humanity? of enhanced sympathy and compassion. So what I wondered about with the group was using some of the concepts that we had developed. Um, how, does, uh, how does life shift? So I'm wondering with you guys, you know, what, what these circumstances have evoked in your own motivations, in your own practices that seem different that seem to point out to what is of fundamental to your integrity, to what might be new, and what you're concerned about, about how that may shift, if you think it may shift the cultures at all. And I'll be silent for a moment. Yeah, put that into the groups. But all right. um, just all I would say is that just, how has your world changed? How have you changed? What do you think is gonna persist? What are the uh, how? What are the assets or liabilities about what is like what might persist? If it goes on long enough, um, how that how might that affect the cultures? That's I'm just you know okay. you've been so thinking about open. your great. own circumstances in all different ways. So just have yeah. at it. Great, great. Hello, welcome back, everyone. And um, we can. Um, have each group kind of share out a little bit or ask questions, whatever would work for you. And when you can come off mute so that um, you can be part of the conversation and anybody else that wants to jump in can be part of the conversation. So group one had Chet, Jean, Jeanette, and Madeline. Does that group want to come on and share a bit? Jean, I think you should. And you're on mute, so you need to unmute yourself. There you go. Oh, God, how do I? Um, it was really very connective. <laughs> so when, thank you for sort of getting us to a point of climax um, that we had so much to share with each other. I think what was at the core for us was just um, our respective sense of of how, what do we do during the sense of isolation that came on during COVID? Um, I, I don't know if I want to name names, but, but we had people that were in their 70s that really began to think about mortality in a very real way, um, but also a positivity of 
what do I do now? How do I not survive but persist in the activities that I may normally be doing with my family members or um, friends and, you know, scholastic pursuits, et cetera. Um, I had someone very inspiring in my group who actually is working through the aftermath of having been um, infected with COVID. And this is this was my first, so I haven't met anyone, known anyone, and um, this person is surviving very well and not traumatized, I don't think, at the moment. Um, so there was a real sense of feeling into what that's like without talking a lot about it. Um, and then just some general sharing of how do we connect with what each other's are feeling. Um, so I'll just stop there. Um, if there's anything else that should be shared, please jump in for my group. It was an honor to be in that group. Thank you. Okay, good. Any, when do you want to have any comments between groups or should I just move on to the next one? Let's move on. Let's just hear everybody talk and then we'll see if we... Okay. All right. So the next group is two with Edith, Melanie, and Wynn. Anybody but me? Edith, go ahead. I can try. Um, hi, Jean. Do you remember me? <laughs> so anyway, um, we were in a small group. There were three of us. And it was a, an interesting conversation on um, the effects of how we have viewed the effects of this pandemic on behavior. It was very interesting mix because one of our members is from Canada, um, where as she said, they have um, a logical and, and sensible and intelligent leader. <laughs> That's what she said, but we all understand and we talked about how the politics of what's going on during this time has affected us all. So, and has affected this pandemic. So for those of us in the United States, we might feel just a little bit more anxious and uh, have many other issues because we have an unprecedented situation along with another unprecedented situation. Um, we talked a little bit about our comfort levels of being on lockdown. And I think um, uh, Dr. Schwartz and myself, and I believe also Melanie, I'm sorry, I should have said the names. Uh, we all feel fairly comfortable. In fact, uh, on, being in isolation wasn't so um, such a hard thing for us to do. But um, I think I brought up the fact that um, people's person, from what I'm seeing coming from a large city, I'm in Chicago, that I'm not ex exactly happy with how people's behaviors are, are acting up or playing out. Large groups of people are not being rational. Some people have not responded very well to being on lockdown that's imposed by someone else. And maybe that imposition by someone else is what's is the issue because maybe if we were the ones who were rationally thinking we need to isolate ourselves then this would be easier for some so um and then lastly we talked about demonstrations of, of greetings to, to each other that it's very difficult on lockdown being in isolation with mask on to show a smile or you know we have to now be a little bit more demonstrative with a nod a wave of the hand uh, go that extra mile to let people know that we are concerned about each other. Please add something more if I miss something. Thank you. All right, very good. So group three then had Jacob, Joe, Nancy, and Tara. Any of them want to jump Nancy, in? Nancy, I nominated you since I came in late. And you got to unmute yourself, Nancy. Just a nomination, but <laughs> there she is. Good. Did I do it? Yeah. I'm not muted anymore. Okay. 
So we didn't really follow the rules. We were just actually, it was just Tara and I in the beginning, um, just um, chatting a little bit about where she's from and all of that. And then Joe connected and Tara asked me the question of what is descriptive psychology? And um, so Joe came in and helped that conversation flow much easier. Um, and then at the very end, um, I think we started talking about um, uh, just the effects on what we're noticing uh, internally, you know, in terms of personally what we're doing to sort of deal with our situations and externally. Um, Joe, I'll just mention that you had mentioned just briefly that you're just finding people more um, kinder, um, more um, in tune with each other. Um, you know, I found myself going to this manic uh, phase of making masks and medical caps and sending them to New York City. Well, the um, and there's one of them <laughs> right there. Um, oh, that looks good. Um, yeah. So, um, you know, it, it's been a transformation in terms of me, I can speak to that, but it's been, it's been an interesting ride, but I do think the sense of being privileged is really a significant event here that's um, been more in the fore foreground for me, just thinking about, um, it's always been that way. I mean, I, I've lived a very privileged life, most of us I think have, um, probably, you know, in this room, I'm just surmising, but, um, but there's so many other people that are not, and so many other people that are totally affected at this point with this virus that it's, um, you know, for me, it's been just to do what I can do. And I can also say just from personal view that I've noticed even speaking with people from, various places around the world, if I've contacted some whatever um, group of, it, it just feels like there's a sense of, of unity aside from what I'm experiencing politically in the United States. So we didn't get totally into that conversation until the very end about um, the effects of COVID. Okay. Thank you, thank you. And then the, the last group is Peter, Velma, and Rick. Okay, v Velma, you want to say, I don't see Peter <laughs> somehow, so it would be weird to ask him to. Uh, Velma, is it okay if I uh, say some words? Absolutely. Okay, Wynn, thanks a lot for setting the stage. It's really uh, great things to, uh, to explore. We were thinking about interconnections, like uh, starting with like, improvisation people have to have, have had to learn to improvise and now um, we see connections like Peter was talking about uh, conversations nature uh, a more natural way of interacting with each other instead of controlling things in, a, in conventional ways and uh, our concern if I uh, like Velma was also talking about is we did that and now as we move back we might lose that again so then we uh, we see improvising again as something that you have to do when the normal way of working and thinking doesn't work out. And then um, you return to the other part of it. And we think that it's a challenge right now to sense what's going on and bring these connected, the in interconnections like the Taos Institute, CMM, Bateson Institute, all people that somehow have uh, an idea about how all these things connect, about another way of interacting with each other. And then helping people in education to sense something about that and have more alternatives than the traditional way of thinking. All right, great, thank you, Rick. So I think that's all for the groups. I hope I didn't miss anyone. So when um, I invite you to come on, we've got about six minutes left, if you would like to kind of wrap us up here. Um, also, if anybody would like to be in touch you may um, put your email in the chat and save the chat for um, your own use. Um, and I'm also gonna put a link in the chat to a web page, which is our Taos online learning community. And this conversation can move over to that platform. If you'd like to be in conversation with each other online, Wynn can visit that page 
every once in a while and, and participate. And that's where the recording of this will also be. So, when I turn it over to you, but I just wanted to let everybody know I'm going to put that link in the chat. Terrific. Um, so, what I'm aware of is I actually didn't explain what descriptive psychology is, which is uh, it's the uh, the subject matter that tries to get at the foundational um, basis for the behavioral sciences, the logics, the, uh, the elements, um, and it's based on the person concept. But what I did want to talk about and what um, make a brief summary about is why I think the pandemic uh, provides us with this unique laboratory, you know, come hell or high water, um, that, uh, that we all are participating in some ways. Um, there's only been a few historical experiences that any of us have, or that many of us uh, have participated in, um, maybe none for most of us, where there's been a global phenomena of uh, common stress. Um, you know, we've got the period after World War I uh, in, uh, in Europe, especially in Germany. We've got um, uh, the Great Depression. Um, we've got the, the Western expansion uh, post-World War II. Um, but periods of massive stress uh, that serve as a background of circumstance, a common circumstance that all of us are participating in, means in some fashion all of us are making choices uh, or acting out our lives in ways that in some way are informed by that overall global circumstance. We're making judgments, hedonic, prudent, ethical, and aesthetic judgments that are guiding our behaviors, um, that are informing our behaviors under some generally broad set of global circumstances. And so part of what I've been very concerned about is um, uh, given that these circumstances for most, for many are very stressful. Um, if we do end up in what is a reasonable likelihood of a, a global depression, um, then we find ourselves in circumstances of scarcity. And under these circumstances, um, one would expect in the West uh, to see, um, well, populisms that are sort of based on, on fear of the other, and at the same time, massive re reallocation of economic resources, income inequities, inequities and privilege are likely to become even more amplified. If this lasts long enough, and if it lasts long enough that we develop new personal characteristics in the midst of it, um, we become some of the culture itself shifts. Now, part of in contrast to that are I think things like the Taos community, groups of people that, that are interested in forming communities that are looking for appreciative inquiry. They're looking for ways of identifying, um, ways of creating communities that are, that are involved in positive growth. Um, the pandemic, is probably a prequel to other pandemics, but it's also a prequel to, to, uh, to um, climate change, to other sorts of stresses. Are the generation of our very young um, who are gonna be massively impacted should there be a global depression, do they become informed in a different way? Or are they our future Nazis? Or are they both? You know, which side are you on? Which sides are you gonna be on? Um, this may return to a, to a kind of normal in which we go back and we tell stor war stories about, you know, how you handled the pandemic. But when there are circumstances in which we are all kind of in the same boat, but some places in the quarters, these boats are more comfortable than others. And the boat may be sinking in some places. There may be lifeboats for some and life life lifeboats for, the, for others. How does that inform our politics, our sense of who we are as a community, of who we can be and have an empathic connection to? And as we talk about the, 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 the people that we think are misbehaving right now, well, what are their perspectives on their own actual sense of danger or their, their fears of what their future will bring? Um, is there the sense of, you know, that I'm gonna be so economically dislocated that I do have to take these risks. And I have to take these risks even at your expense to keep my family afloat. We have a situation in which um, these stresses will bring some of us together, some of us more comfortable and others more desperate. And if it lasts long enough, um, I think we're in a, a situation in which our uncertainties are amplified by everybody else's uncertainties under a common stress. And a stress that amplifies the experience of the danger in the other. The danger and the purity and danger themes of contamination, of filth, 
the issues that make you want to, that make some people want to build a wall, want to isolate, want to sequester. Um, and that's what I'm concerned about. That's what I'm been especially interested in. And what I think this notion of, of the, the, at least the descriptive concepts of the judgment diagram and uh, the aspects of motivation that we are fully aware of, those that we are aware but are reluctant to acknowledge, and those that we may not be able to acknowledge at all, um, may become more amplified, especially the stuff we may be less willing to acknowledge uh, under circumstances of stress. Um, will this bring out our better angels? Well, for some. Will it make us more desperate and uh, prudent in a very local way for others? Well, it has for me. Um, I'm quite aware of the fact that um, I, you know, I want this uh, to be over, but I don't want it to end because I'm enjoying my comfort. Some of my neighbors are not. Um, and I think that's going to, if it lasts long enough, is going to inform the sorts of political and social decisions people make later on. Um, and that's, that's where I'm sitting right now. Uh, ambivalent about my contentment. Worried about the implications of um, the closed university. Uh, scared about uh, the elections. Um, looking forward to the food that's going to be delivered later this afternoon that I have to go shopping for. Uh, and the fact that afterwards I'll go back home, put on my sweatpants, and conduct a couple of therapy hours um, in a different room in a more comfortable chair. I hope you guys are safe and, and, and healthy and, uh, and have good company. Um, uh, and, and if you want a, want a good book, um, um, well, this is interesting. I mean, it's got lots of good stories. It's, uh, it will actually tell you something about descriptive psychology um, far more than I said today. Uh, and, uh, you know, and if it can take you to the work of Peter Osorio, um, it will, that will be doing you a service. Thank you so much, Wayne, for being here today and sharing your book and guiding the conversation with us. And thank you, everyone, for joining in this dialogue with the author. Yeah. Kudos, kudos. Woo. And um, we uh, do these dialogue with the authors just about once a month. So be looking for the next one in June. It'll be announced in our newsletter. So be looking for that. And um, I put the link in the chat for the ongoing online conversation if anybody would like to join there um, as well as the recording from this call will be there also so thank you so much and have a wonderful day Bye thank you